So the first website I really go to is for more of a longer range forecast and it's where you can get most of your accurate real-time space weather news and that's through uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They have a space weather prediction center. And here you can see a bunch of headlines getting in some of the news about uh, the up and coming predicted geomag geomagnetic storms. But on this website, there's, there's so many different headers you can go into and, you know, you can go probably one of the best ones. It's like a three day forecast where it gives you a rough estimate of when they anticipate the arrival of the coronal mass ejection. Now, this has a three day lead time. Generally, we are imaging the sun at all times and we can see the activity physically with the cameras, but we can't really distinguish what that activity is um, until it hits the satellites closer to Earth. So we do visually watch activity at the sun, but it takes three days for whatever leaves the sun to get to Earth. So that's kind of how we can forecast three days ahead, essentially. And these numbers um, in the columns with the dates are called the, uh, the KP index, which is something that I don't use as gospel, but it does give a general idea of what the strength of the aurora is predicted to be. And as you can see right now, we have some activity expected through November 30th and December 1st. And you have to remember all these times are in UTC. So wherever you're at, you have to look at your local time and compare to UTC. Um, so you can get somewhat of an idea of when Northern Lights are forecast with some advanced timing here. Get into the shorter range uh, forecasting tool, which is really Every, th this page is the one I go to most and it's called spaceweatherlive.com. It's available as a website. It's also available as an app and it really, it has this dashboard here that kind of just puts all of your information nice and neatly packaged into a very, very attractive looking and easy to read um, format. Starting at the top, we have the KP index, which is really a rough estimate from uh, the magnetometers as to what is going on in the atmosphere right now um, and it goes from zero to nine but we can look into the forecast and it can't the forecast does line up with the uh, NOAA forecast usually and as we can see basically what you're reading here is if you take out the KP numbers you're just reading that uh, Wednesday, there's a chance of a uh, pretty good aurora, but then starting Thursday into Friday, we have really good chances of stronger aurora, which is what we are looking for in the southern states or anywhere that's not so far north uh, that gets regular aurora. Moving down to the solar wind, this is something that's very important. It is the speed of the particles that have left the sun and between three, 350 and 450 is generally like a baseline level of what the solar wind sits at at any given time and the density is in particles per centimeter cubed which is also generally sits around three four uh, centimeter cubed um, interplanetary magnetic field is just sitting really baseline at four nanoteslas right now and the BZ, which is a really important factor, is just kind of bouncing right around zero. So what we're looking for, what I look at most often as a gauge for whether I'm going to see Aurora, is the hemispheric power. Because this is the potential power that's building in the upper atmosphere. It's a, it's fact, it factors in all of these components, the uh, speed, density goes into this equation to make the hemispheric power. 
And this also transfers over to a nice figure here called the auroral oval, which you can see it has this slight green color here showing uh, very low potential for um, very weak aurora where it's dark right now. So what we want to see where we're at in the southern states is we want to see that gigawatt power start to go up, start to get boosted. It's sitting right now about 10 gigawatts. You can say oh, 11 gigawatts. That's very, very low. And we're not going to see any aurora in the southern US from that. What we're looking for is for that figure to start boosting up. And this is kind of a color coordinated scale they have here. Uh, it's because it's low right now, it's green, but as it starts to build, it goes through yellow to orange to red. And what we're looking for is for it to build up and around 100 gigawatts. Preferably, we want it to get over 100 gigawatts, and I've seen it get as high as 135 when I saw some of the best aurora I've ever seen in Oklahoma. This is what the scale looked like. It was 130. Uh, and that auroral oval diagram looked like this with the very high chance overhead aurora in the northern US. And we were in the southern US and we were able to see the top of that auroral, uh, the auroral curtains. So we were seeing the high upper reds of the aurora while the people underneath were seeing the green looking straight up. Um, so yeah, we want to see this gigawatts start to trend upwards. And what, what we're looking at here on this graph is it's like a three hour window. So we can see, um, how it's been and, and what it is now. And you can see a little bit of where, where the, uh, of where the, the data is going, where it's trending. If it's going from now, if it's going to the right upwards, you know it's getting stronger. The power in the atmosphere is getting stronger. So that's the key factor for us is to watch that hemispheric power. And if it gets up around 80, 90, 100, if it gets over 100, that's when we start getting really excited down here in the States. The one other component that plays a big part is we need to have a negative a negative number for the bz here now the bz is a it's the uh it's the polarity of that uh magnetic uh, the polarity of the the uh cme that hits us and we want that to be negative and the higher negative the better because the magnetosphere of the earth is a positive uh, polarity. So that shock wave of a highly negative coronal mass ejection is what causes the big disturbances and the atoms get shook up, the photons to get released and for us to get major aurora geostorms. Um, so you'll see when the CME hits, first of all, you usually see the density here, jump up to, it depends, sometimes 20 through 40 uh, pot, uh, particles per centimeter cubed. And the wind speed will go up slightly after. And it might jump up. It might not go up that much. It might go up to 500. It might go 6. I've seen it 7, 800, sometimes 900 kilometers a second. The higher on that, also the better. The higher on the wind speed, the higher this hemispheric power builds as we get blasted with it over time. The IMF uh, will also increase, but then we want to see that BZ go negative. And we were looking for a figure right around negative five to negative 20, and we need it sustained. The longer it's sustained to the south, we'll just have this flat line to the south. It's the best thing to see. You will just see this hemispheric power start to rise and rise and rise very quickly. The higher the wind speed, the lower the negative BZ, 
the higher that hemispheric power will build and the more excited we get down here for seeing Aurora. So yeah, if it gets up around 100, 120, um, we have a little bit of a heads up uh, on these graphs. If you look at the solar wind, uh, you look on the left hand side. So what we're seeing over here is everything that's uh, everything that's past Earth. This is came from the satellite and it's past Earth. And this is what's upcoming from the satellite to uh, to the right is what's upcoming from the satellite to Earth. This is all that's hit Earth and it's gone past. So it gives us a good idea of what is coming. And if we keep our eyes on the right hand side of the graph, we can really kind of do this short term 60 minute forecast, which, you know, makes you decide on whether to get out the door or not. And it can, you know, make you um, help you to decide when to shoot, to save your batteries, um, maybe to move around to different foregrounds. If you have been shooting Aurora and it's quietened off, you can kind of, that, that can kind of help you to determine whether you've got time to move without missing anything. Um, just need stuff like that. It's a little bit advanced, but that's what I use all of that information for. And there's another website that's pretty neat to use. Uh, if you go to aurorawatch.ca, you can sign up for email alerts right here. And this is a site that's set up by the University of Alberta up in Athabasca, but that's pretty much directly north of us here in um, Oklahoma and the Southern States. And this site sends out automatic emails uh, when their magnetometers are hit a certain level of activity. And it's really to alert people in Canada of the chance of seeing overhead aurora or, you know, pretty close to overhead aurora. So it's also a good chance for us down here to know when things are really kicking off north of us. Uh, so if you set up your email alerts there, um, it can help you. It, it, it has yellow, orange and red alerts. And generally speaking, every time I've been out and caught Northern Lights in Oklahoma, I have also gotten red alerts from Aurora Watch. So that's a really cool uh, website to use. This video is getting kind of long, sorry, but um, another couple of things to go over. If you're out, if you get out and you're shooting Aurora and all, all the data looks good and it's starting to, things are starting to build or they already have built and you're actually out in the field looking to see or shoot Aurora. Um, there are some visual cues you can pick up with your camera in long exposures. Um, very often there is a thing called a stable auroral red arc, which is just basically a big thick red line that can kind of rainbow across the sky in the northern horizon. Uh, you can't see that with your eyes. It's really restricted to long exposure photography, but it has half the time. This is really a precursor to um, seeing some pillars some other aurora beneath it, beyond it, that, that that line is actually sitting quite far south of where the aurora activity is usually. It's normally uh, on a geomagnetic, geomagnetic field line far south of the aurora activity, but it is a good marker for the potential of having aurora coming up because it, it means there is, there's the shock up there, there's, um, there is some action. Viewing with the eyes is very tough down here because we only generally get to see the very upper fringes of the aurora. And I mean, they can fill the horizon, but a lot of times the colors, it's not the greens that you see in a, in a lot of these uh, northern regions, which are a lot easier to see with the eyes. You get to see down here the reds and the pinks, the purples and the blues. And these colors kind of scatter a lot over distance. So uh, they have to be pretty intense for us to see them with our eyes down here. But you can generally, during the really the strongest show I've ever seen down here, 
what I noticed most was the movement. And once your eyes get adjusted to the dark and I could see the movement of the pillars, then I started to see colors and it was pinks and reds and they were very intense and very, very noticeable. So it takes a lot to get your eyes adjusted to the dark. And if it's just a diffuse, non-active kind of um, feature, you probably won't see it with your eyes, really that movement and the contrast to the rest of the sky is, is what you would pick up with your eyes. And the contrast is another worry when there is moonlight in the sky. Uh, like right now we have, what is our moon phase? It's almost a full moon. So that reflected sunlight from the moon back into our atmosphere, um, it turns the sky kind of blue. It's harder to contrast and see a lot of uh, these different colors that comes from Aurora, especially at long distances and especially the higher features that we see further down south, the purples and the blues and everything else. Um, they just don't have the contrast um, that we'd like for even photography. Um, they would get, when you're taking long exposure shots of a blue or purple aurora against the moonlit sky, it just all kind of blends together as a big blue kind of scene. So that's, that's another concern and one that might want you, if you'd taken photographs to maybe shorten those, uh, exposures up a little bit to like, um, maybe five, 10 seconds rather than say going for a full, like 25, 30 second exposure. But I hope this has been a little bit of help for anybody. Um, I, as far as focal lengths and everything goes, um, I shoot when, when I, I caught Aurora 14 millimeters here and it's filled the frame. Um, it's, it's, it's a, if you go wide, you can generally, if it's a good event, you can go wide and generally get something really neat. So that's what I would recommend is just going wide. Don't worry about trying to get telefocal shots or anything. I go 14 millimeters to 35 millimeters most. Um, and yeah, if you follow me on social media, maybe I'll do some real time um, posting at some point. Um, or I do do workshops if you keep posted for that. And best of luck, everybody out there. If you're going out chasing, just be safe. There's lots of deer around and. Um, be safe on the roads, especially driving at night when you're tired. All right. Good luck.